Jason Plummer is our guest speaker for this evening. Uh, thank you so much for accepting to do this over uh, a YouTube live stream. Um, Jason is a, a consultant at Security Compass and he will be sharing his insights on uh, threats in AWS and cloud environments. Um, so as I mentioned, if you have any questions, use the live chat. Um, otherwise, we will uh, get going. Um, Jason, all, all yours. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So the talk is titled uh, Lift and Adrift, uh, Understanding Threats in an AWS Environment. Uh, the goal here is to um, outline some of the quirks of using AWS services. Um, so with that, uh, just go ahead and get started. Um, just a bit about me. Um, uh, senior security compass, uh, senior security consultant rather at Security Compass, uh, AWS certified. Uh, I did graduate from UOIT. Uh, it's now changed the name to uh, Ontech U. Um, just on a sort of side note, not sure how I feel about that. Um, but in terms of why you should care about what I have to say or why I've been invited here, I've done some let's say cloudy things. Um, I do have some experience with uh, cloud security programs, et cetera. Um, in terms of what we will try to get covered this uh, this evening, um, we'll start with a basic introduction into uh, AWS security, understanding what uh, a secure AWS environment means, and move on to threats um, within the environment. Um, these threats are generally going to be uh, in one of two categories. Um, services either uh, working as intended, um, and the phrase there is in quotation marks, um, because uh, they are exactly how the services are intended to work. They're all well-documented. Um, they might just not be intuitive if you're not familiar with the service, um, which can lead to problems. Um, the second category is permissions. Um, again, this is uh, permissions being a feature and not a bug. Uh, it's just a case where the permissions do uh, exactly what you tell them. Um, they grant permissions for exactly what you allow, um, but they may be leveraged in sort of unintended ways. Um, and then finally, sort of sum everything up um, with some takeaways on how to prevent uh, the threats at sort of a higher level. Uh, so when we talk about securing AWS, uh, it's sort of a, a nuanced statement. Um, the fact that AWS and their infrastructure is secure, uh, that does not automatically equate to uh, your data being secure when you're leveraging their services. Uh, instead, um, actually securing your environments requires a collaborative effort um, between AWS securing the infrastructure portion um, and the customer that is using the services and leveraging the controls that AWS provides. Uh, that sort of collaborative model is known as the uh, shared responsibility model. Uh, if you've ever done anything with AWS and their security, um, this is sort of the front and center uh, theme. And that cl collaboration consists of two sort of distinct components. Um, the first is typically referred to as security of AWS, uh, and the second, uh, security in AWS. Um, this is what that shared responsibility model looks like. Uh, up at the top, you see the customer being responsible for security uh, in the cloud. Uh, what that means is that uh, it's your responsibility to leverage whatever access controls and protections are in place to protect your data, uh, depending on what uh, what service you're using. Um, if you, for example, if you're using uh, EC2, um, those controls also require you to manage your own uh, operating system. Um, conversely, if you're using something like S3, uh, your only concerns would be configuring encryption appropriately and uh, implementing the appropriate access controls. Um, for security of the cloud, um, AWS is responsible for that. Um, and that means that uh, 
they deal with all of the infrastructure, uh, physical hardware, data centers, um, the underlying operating system and networking security. Uh, that goes into sort of delivering a secure environment. Um, so if, if you just sum it up uh, very quickly, AWS provides the controls, um, but they don't know what your intended usage is. Uh, so it's incumbent upon the customers to properly implement those controls uh, so that their data is protected. Um, First thing, we are going to start with, um, as I mentioned, services working as intended. Again, there are no zero days, no sort of groundbreaking research here. Uh, this is just a case of services that may not be intuitive, uh, leading to problems um, with your security posture. Uh, we'll go through four scenarios. Uh, the first one is leak credentials via the instance metadata service. Uh, the second, uh, subdomain takeovers. Um, and these apply to multiple uh, services that are being used. Uh, the third one, uh, secrets in storage. Um, this relates specifically to uh, EBS. Um, and then the final one is sort of a, a more obscure local privilege escalation. Um, via AWS Systems Manager. Uh, so for the first um, scenario, the instance metadata service, uh, for those that are not familiar, this is an internal service uh, that AWS provides uh, that is intended for the EC2 instances so that they can retrieve either user data or metadata um, associated with that instance. It also allows retrieval of dynamic things. Um, in essence, it allows the instances to be properly coordinated with um, the EC2 infrastructure on the AWS side. Um, one of the, the interesting things about this service is that it does allow access to certain sensitive information. Um, within the instance metadata, uh, one of the key functions um, from a security perspective is that it allows temporary credential access for any instance profile that is associated with the instance. Uh, it also allows some configuration details uh, in terms of uh, IP address, uh, EMI, et cetera. Uh, in terms of the user data, uh, that is typically where you'll find things like startup scripts and commands that are intended to run at uh, launch of the instance. Uh, so it, it, depending on how well written these scripts are, you could find things like uh, secrets for passwords, tokens, et cetera, um, would be less than ideal. Um, but I have come across instances where those did exist. Uh, the key thing about this uh, instance metadata service is that it uses link local addressing and um, so that it is only accessible from within uh, the EC2 instance. And it is accessible on the uh, IP address 169.254.169.254. So this is what it looks like. Um, when you retrieve temporary credentials, you can see a valid access key, valid secret key, um, and a session token. So for internal uses of uh, AWS services, uh, things that are intended to run on EC2 instances, this is generally how the credentials are retrieved for uh, instance profiles associated with an EC2 instance. Uh, you asked the question sort of if it's link local addressing and it can only be made, um, it can only be accessed from the instance directly, then why would you consider it to be a problem or a threat in any way? 
Uh, the answer to that um, should be fairly obvious if you are um, experienced with web applications, but uh, instances can make requests, um, albeit not intentionally. And the primary reason is that happened um, server-side request forgery um, and proxying tra traffic through an EC2 instance. Uh, for SSRF, uh, the requests, like I said, are made from the instance. Um, they typically allow access to the metadata service. And these are usually caused by uh, URL parsing problems. Uh, so there are a whole host of application-specific attempts, um, several of which have been bypassed and result in sort of leaked credentials. Uh, so these are a couple of um, examples from HackerOne. Uh, SRF leading to private key disclosure. Uh, Bounty reported in 2019. And you might think that um, this is not entirely common. You might never heard of uh, the company that is affected. Um, but this one might be more popular, more recent, um, and had the same impact. So that leads to the question, if a company like uh, Slack can't fix it properly, what chance might you have? Uh, in truth, it is not uh, terribly difficult to fix um, with the caveat that you don't have strange internal services that are leveraging uh, the instance metadata yourself. And the fix is sort of straightforward. In November of 2019, AWS introduced the uh, version two of the instance metadata service. Uh, this changes how the service works. Uh, version one simply required a curl request, a simple HTTP get to the appropriate address, and that would result in retrieving your credentials. Uh, the danger there was any SSRF um, that would be a get was able to retrieve those credentials. Version two changes the whole functional approach to a more session-based um, approach so that it requires a token to be generated for you. And then that token needs to be included in subsequent uh, requests. And this is what happens uh, when that token is not properly included. A simple HTTP get no longer works once uh, IMDS version two is exclusively used. Uh, one of the things to note here is that despite AWS introducing this in November of 2019, the default setup still supports version one and version two. Uh, so if you want to leverage this when you are creating an EC2 instance, you'll need to change it so that you only support uh, version two. And you can do it as well to existing instances uh, by just changing the, um, the metadata instance information so that it requires a token. Uh, apart from doing that, if that is not possible, obviously you get into sort of um, web application protections. Um, you want to audit your applications, make sure that you discover SSRF vulnerabilities primarily um, before they become a problem, um, as well as limiting the scope of uh, instance profiles that are associated with your EC2 instances. And the idea behind that, of course, is that if those profiles are restricted, uh, even if credentials are leaked and attacker is able to exploit a situation, they cannot do much with those credentials. Uh, so that is sort of the most well-known scenario specific to um, cloud providers. Uh, the second scenario is uh, subdomain takeovers. And uh, if you're not familiar with the subdomain takeover, 
It is essentially when a misconfigured DNS record is exploited by an attacker. So the scenario looks something like this. A uh, company creates a new DNS record. Um, this record is intended to be used for a new service um, provided by an external party. Um, so for example, something like Cloudflare or uh, CloudFront or even uh, S3 websites. When the, uh, the company decides that they're no longer going to be using that service, um, they terminate the service, but they leave the DNS record for the subdomain. Um, so at this stage, you have generally a CNAME record that is pointing to a domain that is controlled by your external company provider, uh, your external service provider, rather. Uh, an attacker sort of identifies that, signs up for that service, um, and then claims that subdomain uh, as theirs. Uh, so for example, here, if you were leveraging uh, CloudFront and it had you know, a user-created name as part of your subdomain, uh, you deleted your account with, uh, with CloudFront uh, or Cloudflare. And somebody else were to sign up for it, use that information to create an identical subdomain. Uh, they would then be able to leverage your company's original subdomain uh, to serve arbitrary content. Um, typically, for these types of signups, um, you find CNAME records being used. Uh, the reason for that is that it's very difficult to map uh, a records which require an IP address to an external service and um, where you don't control their load balancing. Um, so how does that apply? Why is that relevant? Uh, there are several services that AWS provides uh, that generate domains for their user resources. Um, this is an intentional decision on their part to support their own internal load balancing. So for example, uh, they will never provide you an IP address that you should be using for something like an ELB. Um, it is always a domain in a predefined format that they use. Uh, what they typically see happening uh, is, again, the legacy behavior of using CNAME records being used to point custom domains to these resources. Uh, and the situation with these resources, they all have a predefined format. Um, if you can see the screen, the green areas or the green characters are randomly generated by AWS. The uh, red portion is user input. Um, and that sort of poses a bit of a challenge um, in terms of subdomain takeovers. Uh, this is one of the protections that AWS have introduced in recent times. Um, but as you can see with the last one, um, which re refers to the S3 website format, the entire thing is still user controlled. Uh, so in the last two to three years, the most common resource uh, falling victim to subdomain takeovers would be the S3 um, websites. Um, and it is for this reason. Uh, trying to take over uh, ELB referenced uh, domain. Um, the last time I, I looked at it, it sort of could potentially run into the number of years, uh, between three to five years to properly exhaust that using uh, AWS resource limits. So it is very difficult to brute force properly. Uh, this is what you typically find. Um, the top shows the ELB custom domain um, that is being mapped to an AWS provided Elastic Load Balancer. 
Uh, the one at the bottom shows uh, DNS lookup for what is a custom S3 uh, website domain. And you'll notice the second one is, like I said, a bit of a quirk um, where the entire CNAME record is static. Um, and that becomes a problem later on um, with why S3 is so vulnerable to domain uh, subdomain takeovers. Uh, so in a situation where this sort of domain is left configured as is, um, but you no longer need the resource, you delete them to manage your resource costs, you end up in a situation where those domains are ripe for takeover. Um, like I said, the two formats that all AWS uh, control domains resolve to are uh, amazonaws.com and cloudfront.com. Uh, the challenge here is that access to these domains are not restricted. All it requires is a valid AWS account. And in terms of being unique, these are not scoped in any way to your account. Uh, these are only regionally unique. So that anyone else um, that tries to create the same resource with the same name within uh, the region has a chance of getting the same DNS uh, domain assigned to their resource. So what happens when the underlying S3 is removed, um, S3 bucket is removed, but the custom domain still exists? Uh, you'll see a request gets properly resolved, um, but there is an error on the, uh, the S3 website uh, endpoint. And it's a no such bucket error, error 404. And if you ever come across this in sort of a real environment, um, you are sort of almost guaranteed of a few hundred bucks in a bug bounty payout. Um, that is, of course, assuming you're well-intentioned. Um, and the reason for that is that by simply creating the appropriately named bucket, um, and you can see it right here in the message, uh, that custom domain will point to your arbitrary content. Again, this is a real thing that has happened uh, dating all the way back to 2016 when uh, these uh, services were sort of more in their infancy. Uh, see here, subdomain takeover and Starbucks. Um, this typically happens or, or it happens more often than not in cases where timed events are taking place and the promotional website is handed over to a third party. Um, another situation of it, like I said, you might think that this should no longer be a problem. It's well known, um, but it's still happening as of January 2020. So the question is how do you resolve it? Uh, Amazon does provide some guardrails. Um, the last time I gave a talk about um, bucket sniping and subdomain takeovers, uh, I realized live on stage, one of the protections that had been recently implemented. Um, and that is generally that when a user releases a resource, when they delete it, it does not immediately go back into the pool internally for uh, AWS resources that another user can claim. Um, if you try to delete a bucket, for example, um, within one account and immediately create it in a second, uh, you'll get an API error trying to create that bucket. Um, the last time our team looked at it, we found there was a delay of about four hours before we were able to create it arbitrarily again. Uh, so that is one of the protections where they lock resources internally before releasing them back into the availability pool. 
Uh, another one of the protections that they implemented um, since the start of their server off service offerings would be introducing a random component to the domains that are generated. Um, and you remember the components that were listed in green. Different resources have different levels of randomness and with CloudFront being sort of the strangest one where the entire dis uh, distribution name is essentially random. In addition to that, uh, AWS has for Route 53 a very specific um, option for records. Uh, it's an A record alias, uh, which sort of some uh, Route 53 magic uh, that's intended to replace C names that uh, would ordinarily reference these resources. But instead of simply placing a C name, what it does is uh, internally resolves the IP address um, before updating your record. Uh, so if you do a check um, of the DNS, it will actually return an, a valid A record with an IP address um, instead of a C name. Uh, it also, for some resources, allows a health check to ensure that the target is still available before updating that IP address. Uh, the caveat here is that it's better than typical C names, but it is still not perfect, uh, especially in the case of S3, um, where there are some quirks due to how uh, S3 handles the virtual host routing. Uh, so this is what that looks like um, in Route 53. Instead of having your typical A record with an IP address, um, you have an alias and then a target to which it is associated. Uh, and when you perform a lookup, you actually see an IP address coming back rather than a C name record with a domain. And that may be more visually appealing to you for a takeover. Uh, so this is the case with S3. This is what it looks like. As I said, there is a quirk um, with S3. So it still does allow for takeovers. Uh, and the reason for that is despite saying that it is performing health check, uh, it, that health check does not work the way that you expect it to. And because it is doing a lookup against the uh, S3 website, uh, US East 1 endpoint, rather than your buckets uh, endpoint. It is not actually validating that your bucket exists. It is simply doing a dynamic lookup for the IP address of the uh, S3 endpoint, or S3 website's endpoint. Uh, so even if your bucket does not exist, it will still resolve, it will still um, allow you to route to it. Um, the only difference um, in terms of normal usage would be that your bucket content does not exist and anyone trying to access your custom domain, in this case, uh, s3.payload.be, will receive the 404 error with uh, no such bucket um, message being displayed to them. Again, with the alias, it is slightly more difficult to immediately ascertain that. Uh, just because of how it's formatted, it does require a bit more of an involved process to identify that. But because of how it works, it still offers the option for subdomain takeovers. Uh, the question then becomes, how do you fix the problem? Obviously, the easiest or the most straightforward way of fixing it, not necessarily the easiest way, um, would be to manage your domains better. Uh, make sure that you never have a dangling subdomain. And this never becomes a problem. Um, one of the ways you can sort of approach that would be to manage your subdomains with Route 53. The idea here is that you closely associate uh, your resources, your custom resources, with the DNS entry for it. 
and you simply delegate uh, the subdomain, the custom subdomain that you're going to be using, um, you delegate that from your primary domain server so that this root 53 uh, entry is the authoritative setup. Uh, and then when you're finished using your resources, you simply delete root 53 entry for it, as well as your ELB S3 bucket, um, CloudFront distribution, whichever one um, you're choosing to use. What then happens is that the DNS lookup fails because there's no authoritative um, DNS server from Route 53. Uh, so that even though your DNS, your primary DNS configuration is misconfigured, it is not necessarily going to be an exploitable situation. Uh, the alternative would be to refine the process for uh, creating and removing resources, uh, particularly your uh, domains, such that if you can automate anything um, along the path, you do that. Um, something like Terraform, for example, can tie everything together. And if you have appropriate providers, um, when you're ready to destroy the resources, uh, everything gets destroyed all in one swift motion, uh, avoiding sort of the human error of leaving something incomplete. If that is not something that you can do easily, um, the alternative would be to ensure you're architecting appropriately. Uh, so for example, if you are trying to host um, static content from an S3 website, uh, that is all you need you probably don't want to do that from an S3 website directly. Uh, you should run that through a CloudFront distribution if you're going to use something like a custom domain. Uh, the reason for that is that the protections in CloudFront are simply better than uh, those within the uh, S3 websites service uh, because it's more purpose-built. Uh, so for example, CloudFront distributions offer you uh, the alter, uh, the option of having alternate names um, where you can put in your custom subdomain. Um, and it requires you to provide a certificate of validation. Um, so you have to provide a valid certificate, even if your intention is only to serve that content over HTTP. Uh, so again, that's subdomain takeover is it's a known problem, but it still exists. Uh, it's still something that you need to be concerned about if you are moving to AWS. Um, one thing to note here is that this is not, as I mentioned, only uh, a problem for AWS. Um, it's just that AWS, given its usage base, uh, sort of increases the frequency with which something like that comes up. Uh, the next scenario is sharing secrets in storage. Um, so just to sort of take a step back and provide a bit of an overview on how things are stored in AWS. And um, there are two types of storage, generally speaking, uh, block storage and object storage. Block storage is uh, designed to provide you with raw access to disks, either real or virtual. And those allow you to manipulate the entirety of the disk um, bit by bit. Uh, so it affords you the option of doing things like a bit by bit copy. And you see this in the uh, Elastic Block Storage or EBS service. Uh, the alternative to that um, would be object storage where all of the low level uh, file system, file management type, scenario sort of operations are abstracted and you are left with uh, files being exposed at a much higher level, typically uh, there is no underlying concern on the user's part where that is stored, 
uh, how to manage the location on disk, um, nothing of that sort. And you see this in uh, Amazon S3. So uh, just in terms of a scenario, uh, let's say you're building an image uh, for your AWS environment, and you want to use a custom Amazon Machine Image or AMI. Uh, your intention is to make this public. Um, so the scenario here would be similar to, let's say, a provider of some sort. Um, you, know, you want to have this package and easy for your customers to use on AWS so that they can simply choose an image from the marketplace, spin it up, and you get billed, um, or rather they get billed um, as you use it. If, for example, your image is manually being built from within the instance, um, which is less than ideal, and you are using snapshots that get created once your desired configuration is attained, um, and then using those snapshots to generate the final AMI, uh, once that AMI is generated, you make it publicly accessible. So why would that be a problem? Or in what situation can that be a threat to your data? Uh, the EBS-backed AMIs, um, they include a snapshot of the original volume. Um, so what which may also include things like your uh, previously. And in a situation where you have been using that instance to build your desired configuration, uh, it is been doing things like using secrets during provisioning or reaching out to internal resources. Um, which required some type of tokens or authentication. Um, you might also have some sort of internal configuration for things that you never intended on sharing. Uh, you just need them to be spun up. Uh, so in this situation, running a recovery tool um, could potentially recover the data. And then uh, you end up unintentionally sharing the secrets with whoever would have access to your AMIs. And this situation is exactly the same because of the underlying uh, EBS snapshot. Exactly the same in cases where you simply make an EBS snapshot available to be shared. Uh, in fact, if you're familiar with forensics in AWS, uh, one of the ways that investigations are done is by making an EBS snapshot of the volume you intend to look at. Uh, so th that would be some of the um, some of the considerations for EBS backed uh, AMIs. Um, So the question then becomes, how do you fix it? Um, it is realistically no different than making sure that any drive that you provide to a stranger um, does not contain secrets. Uh, the best way to prevent the, that accidental sharing from happening is from avoiding widespread sharing of uh, your snapshots and AMIs. And there are going to be times where this is unavoidable. For example, in situations where you are trying to develop uh, acceptable AMIs for an organization or enterprise, um, you have to have those configured. You have to have them made available to your entire organization. Uh, so in those cases, the way you'd want to avoid this would be by developing a bit of a pipeline, uh, making sure that automation takes place so that there's no accidental situation where 
you're logged on to the wrong box and you accidentally copy something uh, that you shouldn't copy uh, or that you, you know, have something run through your volume while you're you're building that image that that should not be shared. Um, and the, the best way is to make sure that it never touches a volume so that there's no concern uh, that it might be still present on the drive. Uh, if this is not something that you can easily avoid, uh, for example, if your process requires accessing secrets, uh, you may want to run some low level forensics to make sure that when you share it, uh, it is not still accessible. Uh, so, see, there are two questions um, in the chat. So, we'll sort of break here. Uh, the first question Will the presentation be made available after? Uh, yes. Um, I will provide the uh, the presentation to Yukfei um, and Jack, um, and they should be able to to post it so that it's accessible to everyone that is interested. Uh, the next question: What are some of the best steps to take? in order to enter the cloud security industry, especially from an IR perspective? Uh, unfortunately, I got out of IR some time ago. Um, so I'm not sure what IR looks like um, on its own. But in terms of how IR interacts with cloud security, uh, one of the primary things that you are going to need to do is to understand what impact uh, every action has. Uh, so for example, within AWS, there are going to be things like CloudTrail logs, um, as well as, as I mentioned, the uh, EBS volumes that you'd need to take a snapshot of. Uh, you'll need to understand how those are generated and uh, what actions will lead to which results. Um, once you understand that context that is specific to your cloud service provider, everything else then, um, as far as I understand, it becomes sort of basic IR. You still need to go through the entire volume to see what type of activity has taken place. Uh, the only difference is that instead of gathering that uh, image from a tower or a data center, um, a rack within a data center rather, uh, you gather it from your EC2 instance within AWS. Um, you still need to pour over the logs to see what actions took place, um, when and who initiated those actions. Uh, the difference is that uh, instead of like a syslog server or something like that, um, you might be parsing over CloudTrail logs or CloudWatch logs. Um, so I think the, the the best steps would be just to understand how the cloud service providers work uh, in terms of generating artifacts that would be IR interesting. Um, and then from there, understanding what limitations those provide um, or, or what limitations um, are there in terms of gathering your artifact. Once you are able to gather those artifacts, like I said, everything else just becomes your typical IR process. Hey, Jason, thanks for this. Um, just for, as a follow-up question, you had mentioned that there are some forensics tools to, uh, to analyze some of these uh, EBS files, for example. Uh, could you tell us uh, some examples of these tools? Uh, yeah, so the one that I'm most familiar with, um, just having used it myself, would be Photo Rec. Uh, so that's Photo R E C. Yeah, P H O T O uh, R E C. Got it. Um. So those that would be the one that would um, be most familiar to me. I'm sure there are tons of others. Um, like I said, I, I have gotten out of IR for some number of years now. So there might be a, a newer, better tool. 
Right. And I think we also have a question from Anja. Um, AWS sells itself on its security. So when these vulnerabilities arise, uh, does it or does AWS send updates or detailed instructions on safeguards for clients? Uh, so in my experience, it, it depends on what the vulnerability entails. Uh, there are, for each of the scenarios that we're going through here this evening, um, the documentation when you are using the service outlines these concerns um, by and large. Uh, if you dive into the details within the, their documentation, uh, a lot of these uh, threats are outlined um, and they have warnings against them. In terms of uh, sort of major changes, so for example, uh, when IMDS uh, v2 was introduced, uh, the metadata service uh, version 2 was introduced, uh, that was hugely publicized uh, because it was sort of a, a well-known vulnerability um, or threat rather, um, not necessarily vulnerability per se. Um, but that was well publicized. Uh, there were sessions at uh, AWS reInvent sort of suggesting very strongly that uh, if you can use it, you should use it, walking users through how things like that might happen um, how you'd configure it. Uh, but if you are sort of coming to the party at this stage with a number of these scenarios well understood and sort of accepted, um, then one of the things you are going to be responsible for doing is making sure you understand how the service works. Um, and to do that, you generally have to read through the documentation that is provided. Uh, obviously, that is no fun, um, and you can sort of rely on talks, blog entries, and um, things like that. Uh, but as I said, when things that are major concerns are addressed, um, AWS does publicize them either through reInvent sessions or through uh, blog entries on their And they do walk you through scenarios on how to address some of those concerns, uh, but they typically don't send them directly to their clients. Um, so for example, if you sign up for an AWS account, uh, you're probably not going to get an email sent directly to you. Uh, there are occasions on which uh, sort of breaking changes are sent to you, um, but those generally have um, sort of limitations on when AWS detects things that are genuine vulnerabilities um, happening within your environment. Uh, so I'm not sure if that that's sort of the answer that you're looking for, if that helps at all. Um, I, I think I think that answers the question. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat right now, so um, we can proceed. Perfect. Uh, so the final scenario that we're going to go through, um, like I said, it's well known, um, or rather, maybe not well known, but properly documented within the service um, documentation. Uh, it's a local privilege escalation for AWS Systems Manager. Uh, this might be something that you're not familiar with. It's one of those um, slightly more obscure services that AWS provides. Um, but if you are in an enterprise uh, sort of enterprise scale organization, uh, you are almost certainly familiar with uh, SSM. Uh, just to provide some background on it, uh, AWS Systems Manager uh, it allows for remote administration of hosts um, from a central portal. And you can think of it uh, similar to Tanium that is installed on EC2 instances. 
the idea is that uh, an agent is run on each of these instances. It connects back to the central server. Uh, from there, you can pick and choose which of the hosts you want to initiate um, various actions on. Uh, so for example, you can trigger updates across all of your Linux hosts uh, using Systems Manager. Because of its, uh, because of its intended purpose, is designed to be run as the root user. Um, and throughout its history, uh, the sort of features available have continuously improved. Uh, so when it was first launched, it was limited to things like uh, basic command execution uh, and inventory management. Uh, I think the primary document was uh, a run command um, where that allowed you to run sort of arbitrary commands um, and they sort of put together a way that that would allow you inventory management um, and baseline patching. Uh, now they have also included things like uh, sessions. So you can provide an interactive shell. Um, and this was one of the things that was sort of very well publicized. There's no longer any need to SSH into your instances. You can use SSM uh, to provide you with an interactive shell. Um, port forwarding. Um, and that is also something that uh, AWS Systems Manager can now support. Uh, so for example, in a scenario where a developer has access to a host uh, for testing their deployment and their code. Uh, instead of having SSH access in, onto this box, uh, they are asked to use SSM. And that way their access can be sort of more easily managed through IAM permissions rather than individual keys on uh, the hosts. And this developer uses a language for which an AWS SDK exists. So Python, Go, Node.js, um, potentially even Java. Uh, if an administrator tries to lock down the, um, the interactive sessions so that they are run as a limited user and not as the root user, but the host has uh, the following two permissions, the uh, run command and the send command. Uh, and the host would have those by virtue of uh, the instance profile that is attached. Uh, then in those cases, uh, the user might as well be root. And the way that happens is sort of a bit of a contrived scenario. Uh, users that have access to the shell, um, they can run AWS commands. Uh, those commands do not require credentials at the time you, you trigger that command. Uh, AWS handles a lot of that on the back end. Um, and if you're running a command using any of the supported SDKs from an EC2 instance, it will get the credentials to run that command um, from the instance metadata service. That's one of its design purposes. Uh, so the AWS SDK will get those credentials if the permissions on that profile allow you to run a command um, or rather send a command. Uh, then the command is sent to the AWS Systems Manager central server. And you know that will allow you to run whatever command is, is configured. You can run essentially arbitrary commands at that stage. Uh, when those commands are sent from the central server back to the host, uh, they will be executed as the root user. Uh, so despite the sort of best intentions of the administrator trying to restrict the developer in this scenario to having only a limited shell and having access to only the things that they should really need access to, uh, if those permissions are configured on the box, uh, then the user might as well be root. Um, like I said, they'll be able to access, uh, or rather 
perform arbitrary commands. And this is sort of well documented, as I said. And every at every stage, these commands will be logged. And um, but that still does not remove the impact of root commands being run on the host. Uh, so in terms of avoiding these scenarios, a basic uh, sort of least privilege, understand that permissions have consequences. Um, in an ideal world, you will be able to understand what each of those uh, permissions allow. And then uh, you'll be able to restrict access using only the required, the bare minimum required permission set. Uh, it's very easy when you're trying to set these things up uh, initially to simply go for the managed policy that has service name full access uh, because that generally gets everything working. Um, the downside of that is that it includes essentially every action, uh, permission to run every action that that service offers, uh, which is rarely ever the case um, that that full permission set is needed. Uh, so the ideal situation here is that you understand which permissions are required and you scope uh, the permissions down to just those. In terms of the SSM send command, uh, there is rarely ever a good reason to have that associated with an EC2 instance. That is typically reserved for your administrators, your uh, IT folks, uh, or your systems op folks that uh, are going to be managing those instances. And the SSM uh, run command is the one that you typically want to have on the, the instances themselves. Uh, so those are the scenarios. Like I said, those are all properly documented. If you are able to go through all of the voluminous information that AWS provides, um, the sort of next area that you want to focus on um, would be permissions um, and understanding that permissions are generally not a bug. Um, they are functioning exactly as they are designed to function. Uh, it's just that in some cases, the consequence might not be immediately apparent. Uh, so just a sort of bit of a AWS uh, IEM 101, um, identity and access management, uh, the AWS service references a number of entities, um, and these entities are typically referred to as principles. Uh, these can range from users, groups, or roles to uh, AWS services um, or even other AWS accounts. Uh, the way that permissions are granted, security policies are used, um, and those are then associated with either an individual um, or one of these entities or with resources. Um, but we'll just sort of quickly go through the identity-based ones uh, because that is sort of the more common one um, that you might encounter. It's sort of the fundamental basis for which uh, understanding security policies is necessary. Uh, so just in terms of the security policies, they can relate to either specific uh, actions and or resources. And they can be one of two effects, uh, either allow or deny. And what that means is that you are either for a particular action and resource combination, you're either explicitly allowing it uh, or explicitly denying it. Uh, the security policies also work sort of like your uh, typical firewall where there's a implicit deny. So if something is not explicitly listed here, it will fail. 
uh, the, the authorization check will fail. Um, if there is an explicit deny, says you are not allowed to perform this action on any combination of resources, um, that will always be uh, denied attempt. Um, and the only way that you will ever be able to perform an action is if uh, there is an explicit allow for that action and resource that you're targeting, um, and there is no explicit deny for that. Statement will include the effect. Hey, Jason, uh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I think you cut off a little bit uh, just before, so uh, would you mind just going back a little bit, maybe 10 seconds? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so security policies, um, as I was saying, uh, in terms of the way they are evaluated, um, there are sort of three options for that evaluation. There is the explicit deny, uh, an explicit allow, and an implicit allow. Uh, and they're evaluated in that order. If after looking through all of the policies that apply to a requested action, uh, there is an explicit deny that is present for that action and resource combination, and then the action fails. Uh, if there is an explicit allow for that action and there is no explicit deny, um, then that action is allowed. And if there is no mention of that action whatsoever um, as it relates to that resource, then it is an implicit deny and the uh, action fails. Um, like I was saying, the, these policies can either be associated with the identity or resource. Uh, the resource-based, um, not every resource supports it. Um, and the idea behind that is that uh, if you have something like an S3 bucket that is intended for sort of access more broadly, it's easier to configure that access on an S3 bucket than it is to configure access on several hundred users uh, so that you can just attach a policy to your S3 bucket uh, that grants the permissions on the, on the particular uh, objects that you're interested in, in allowing everyone to access. And then um, it doesn't necessarily matter what the individual users have permissions to do, as long as they can do the S3 get object, for example. Uh, in terms of the identity-based uh, security policies, where we're going to focus a bit more here tonight, um, the policies generally consist of a collection of statements and each of the identity-based um, statements have an effect. And that typically defines whether the action is going to be allowed or denied. Uh, the action relates to uh, a collection of the service and operations. Um, so you can have any number of these. Um, you can do wildcards as well. Uh, so for example, you can have something that says S3 colon star. And in that case, you're referring to the S3 service and every action that that uh, service offers, or every operation that the service offers. Uh, the resources are referenced by their Amazon resource name or ARN, A-R-N. And these allow for more granular refinement of the approve or deny. So for example, if you were to allow a user to do something like change their password, you would want to have an effective allow uh, action of uh, IEM change password. And if you were to leave the resource section um, just as a wildcard, the impact that would have would be to allow that user to change anyone's password rather than just their own. Uh, so you can, in the resource section, use uh, their own user, uh, IEM user, and that would allow them to change the password, um, but restrict them from changing anyone else's. Uh, 
And the way that these policies typically take effect, um, they are attached to one of the entities, either the user group or uh, role. And once they're attached, they take effect and they actually have um, the situation where they, they grant the permissions that are outlined in the policy. A policy that it is not attached to any resource will not have any meaningful effect. Uh, so some of the things that you want to look out for when you are setting up your environment um, and trying to secure it would be uh, dangerous permissions. These may seem very obvious. Um, and when I talk about dangerous permissions, what we're talking about here are direct modification of privileges of some sort. So either changing the policies that are associated with a particular user or changing access to uh, existing entities, IAM entities, um, that have additional permissions. Uh, so just to sort of outline a scenario, user A has uh, the IAM attach, let's say, user policy, and they're, they're permitted to perform that action. Uh, there are a number of policies within the account, including um, manage policies which they can then pick from uh, leveraging these permissions they can then attach those permissions uh, or those policies to their own user account and suddenly they have expanded permission sets uh, in terms of how changing access to uh, existing entities can result in additional permissions and it's sort of it's just as straightforward uh, if you can create an access key or a login profile um, those two permissions create the private key and or the uh, ability to log into the console the uh, aws website uh, if you're able to do that as an additional users uh, then you can Instead of using your own permission to do something, you can use somebody else's permissions. Um, you know, the individual performing those actions are still the, is still the same person, uh, but they're then able to sort of requisition somebody else's uh, either account role um, or group, for example, um, something of that nature so that they can perform those actions as somebody else. Um, I'll check back with the chat to see if there are any questions. Um, I think there are a couple of questions. Uh, yeah. So I think the first question is uh, from Anja again. Uh, to get into AWS security, you start in general cybersecurity, or are there other recommended avenues? Uh, so it, it sort of depends on what your intended um, goal is with uh, AWS security. Uh, general cybersecurity provides you with an understanding of the sort of broad threats and potential attack vectors. Um, AWS security, if you are sort of very intent on getting into managing security at an AWS shop, for example, uh, the first thing that you need to do is to understand how those services work um, from a user perspective. So one of the things that uh, we typically recommend would be having a look at something like uh, the AWS uh, certified solution, um, certified solution architect, um, even the associate level. That gives you sort of a baseline understanding of how the services work, what the considerations are for using each of those services. Um, and then you can sort of leverage that knowledge to identify the path to securing them. Um, so I guess if I, if I were to sum up the answer, uh, sort of a bit of column A and a bit of column B, 
Uh, general cybersecurity provides you with the background and insight, um, but you still have to dive deeply into uh, the AWS specific things. Um, and for that, you need to understand how the services work. Um, and one of the, the, the quick ways of doing that from a developer or a solution architect point of view um, would be to explore at least the content um, for those certifications. Uh, if you're not intending on using those certifications, they might not necessarily be of value to you, but the content that those uh, certifications cover would be great learning if you are interested in AWS security. Uh, and then I think another question was if there are any sort of AWS capture the flags and go through the scenarios. Uh, there is sort of the most common one. Um, it's called flaws, F-L-A-W-S. Uh, there are two versions of it, flaws and flaws two. Those are sort of uh, the most prominent ones that I can think of. Uh, if you are more into capture the flag type scenarios, there are uh, sort of tracks that explore cloud security. Uh, so, for example, at Hackfest, there were there there was a track that that explored it. Um, but if you're interested in sort of a more hands-on approach to these particular scenarios and scenarios that are similar to this, uh, then flaw, flaws would be a great starting point for that. Uh, so I think those are the questions that we have at the moment. Um, so I'll just get back to the, uh, the permissions. Um, when we left off, we'd covered dangerous permissions uh and those permissions were by themselves dangerous uh the next concern would be chaining permissions uh so if you've ever had a look at something like uh, bloodhound for example you can see how the uh, you know sort of maps your path to domain administrator uh think of these permissions as doing something similar uh, where you can leverage permissions on various services and then leverage the permissions those services have to get to an expanded uh, sort of expanded function or, or action set. Uh, so for example, if user A is restricted to performing only actions on service A, uh, but service A can perform actions on service B. Um, and this can be through things like uh, roles with the appropriate trust policy. Uh, then if user A is unrestricted in terms of access to service A, um, then they can leverage that service to perform whatever actions service A would have permission to do on service B. And the most common sort of culprit for these uh, chaining permission scenarios would be passing unexpected roles. Uh, so if you ever create a security policy um, with an IAM pass role and the resource is sort of a wildcard, uh, then that is sort of asking for trouble. Users ideally should never be allowed to pass arbitrary rules. Uh, for example, if I am a developer and I'm allowed to create EC2 instances, there should be a, a list of predefined roles that I'm allowed to pass to the EC2 service. Uh, the reason for this is that uh, allowing arbitrary roles to be handed to different services can often result in a the escalation of privileges, um, and that would be as a result of the permissions associated with the, the role passed. Uh, so in this scenario, we have a policy that looks something like this. Uh, it allows actions to EC2 create instance and uh, IEM pass role. 
and it does not restrict the resources um, at all. Uh, so they're wildcard resources. Uh, if a role exists that grants administrative access, um, but a user cannot assume it, but that role does have a trust relationship with EC2. And by that, what I mean is that you can attach it to an instance as an instance profile. Then uh, the user can simply create a new EC2 instance using that role with administrative access as the instance profile. Those permissions are allowed. You know, they wait a few moments for the instance to be spun up. And then they SSH onto that EC2 instance. Because of the interaction with the SDK and the uh, instance metadata service, the user can perform arbitrary AWS commands uh, that will get their credentials from that instance profile. Again, this instance profile would have administrative access, so they'd be able to perform any action on any resource within the account. Uh, then that user would be able to do sort of similar. Uh, by logging into that EC2 instance with that uh, role assigned as the instance profile, you would then be able to perform any action from sort of the entire suite um, that would be available to you as a result of the, uh, the administrative access policy. And uh, sort of the, the final um, concern in terms of permissions would just be straight up not configuring them properly or having them at all. Um, so we're talking here about missing access controls. Uh, several resources, um, they allow public access. Uh, they might encourage it from time to time, but not every one of your resources that uh, is offered by that service would necessarily fall into that category. Uh, so think of things like uh, S3, Elasticsearch or Elasticash. Um, these are things that can be public, but are not always sort of expected to be public. Uh, if you go through recent and not so recent breach notifications, you'll find that the news is littered with uh, such incidents, of things becoming public when they should not have been and resulting in sort of a, a whole incident response process and having to do breach notification to all of your customers. Uh, offer you exhibit A. Uh, this is Twitter in 2017, allowing anyone access to their AWS buckets. Uh, this was as a result of something that AWS has fixed. Um, back in 2017, there was an option when you configured access controls for your S3 buckets, uh, it gave you three options. Uh, the owner of the bucket having permissions, um, allowing authenticated users permissions, or having the bucket contents be fully public. Uh, because of how IEM works and its references to users, and authenticated users, you might think that authenticated users in that scenario meant users within your own account. Um, but in fact, it meant anyone with an AWS account. Uh, so this sort of misconfiguration was much more common. AWS has since changed the entire user experience um, and that is no longer an option. Um, but they still, happen with these buckets being public. Um, like I said, you might think that this should be a problem that has been solved, even with the UX changes. Uh, but in January of this year, uh, Razor had a bucket that was quite public. Uh, so that would be sort of the areas of concern when you are signing and using permissions. 
uh, fully understanding that the permissions each have specific uh, particular consequences to them. And if you don't fully understand or appreciate what those consequences are, you can find yourself in some very difficult situations. Uh, so the, the sort of final component here tonight is uh, how do we prevent these threats now that we've been able to identify a number of them? Uh, the first thing you want to do is to make sure that your access is managed. Um, if you have anything more than a single AWS account, you should probably have some type of central authentication. The reason for this is uh, it makes management much easier. It's precisely the same reason that uh, Active Directory is still a thing um, or single sign-on of any kind is still a, th it, it is a thing. And it allows you to sort of have a single location where predefined roles are mapped to users. You manage just a single directory. Um, the alternative to this would be making sure that each individual user is in the appropriate group with the appropriate permissions and anything that is different for them would require customization and, and that sort of leads you down a very difficult to manage path uh, because you also want to make sure that those permissions are mirrored across the different accounts that you might have. Uh, so that you don't end up in a situation where you've revoked permissions for a user that has changed departments in one account, uh, but not in another account, so they can still do things in that other account that they should not be able to do. Uh, the other aspect of managing access would be making sure that the access controls are appropriate, uh, so not granting access to resources that shouldn't have access to them, making sure that anything that is public uh, is intended to be public and that anything that is not sort of strictly locked down is that way for a valid business reason. Uh, next one is, is having effective policies. So part of locking down um, access to specific resources is to avoid whenever possible using the managed policies. Um, but instead uh, using them as a basis for refining your, your own policies. So for example, if you have a user that you intend to give full access to, again, uh, an S3 bucket, um, you don't want to simply attach the S3 full access to them. Uh, you want to use that as a basis to see which actions are required or covered by that, that scenario, and then add additional restrictions to the resource list so that those permissions are only effective on um, the intended resource. Uh, the next stage is, is understanding dangerous permissions. And that sort of comes back to what we're covering, understanding which permissions can result in additional or escalated privileges. Uh, these are generally IEM related, although they can be cases in which um, you can leverage other services to do it. Um, so in cases where a developer has access to change the contents of uh, a Lambda function, for example, um, that Lambda function can perform certain actions. Uh, if they are not sort of intended in the original code, um, but the associated permission set allows it, a developer with access to changing that Lambda code can perform those additional actions. So uh, you want to restrict access to those dangerous permissions whenever possible. And you also want to avoid um, anti-patterns. Uh, so there are things that you can do to make management more easily attained uh, in the way that you write your statements. The problem is that you, you sort of need to understand what the potential consequences are. Uh, so for example, in this case, uh, not action is a quick way of um, sort of permitting everything but this one action. 
so for example, if I want to deny IAM related actions, I can have a statement that allows everything, but instead of having an action, I have a not action IAM wildcard. Uh, the danger with this is that uh, you will need to manage this policy as AWS provides new services. Uh, because if you are essentially saying, I want to use everything but what I specified here, uh, you have to keep track of when uh, AWS releases new services because the everything else but the list of services that that covers will continuously grow. Uh, and then finally, policy guardrails. Uh, there are going to be times when things um, are sort of difficult to do. You have to give somebody administrative access to an account that um, you still want to restrict what their actions might be within that account. Uh, that is the reason things like uh, service control policies, which only apply to AWS organizations, um, or rather accounts that are registered with an AWS organization, um, or permission boundaries exist. Uh, they implement sort of, uh, as I term them, guardrails or restrictions on what permissions um, are. And uh, they will apply even if permissions are explicitly permitted by security policies. The SEP, the service control policies and the permission boundaries will override that um, if you have a deny on that permission there. Uh, so the result is that your effective permissions are the overlap of allowed actions between either your uh, service control policy or your permission boundary and the attached security policies. And um, so that does sort of limit the potential blast radius or, or misconfiguration for account um, permissions. And um, let's check to see if there are any questions. Uh, so how does AWS's out-of-the-box IAM platform work? Does it provide governance capability data on SOD alerts on new or anomalous privileged activity? Uh, so in terms of a default out-of-the-box setup, what you get from AWS is the assurance that the permission set that you grant will be explicitly enforced across all of their services. Uh, if you need sort of tracking for privileged activity, um, they do offer a framework within which that can be done, but it is not out of the box. Uh, you have to implement or leverage certain other uh, functionality. Uh, so one of the things we're actually going to talk about would be um, alerting on privileged activity. And the way you do that is not exclusively through IAM. Uh, you have to make sure that your audit trails are configured properly. And then you have to have something parsing those audit trails and that will generate that alert. Uh, so in terms of out of the box, um, not being in governance myself, I would say that it does take some massaging to get uh, IEM to work the way you would need it to work. Um, but it does have the framework available should you be interested in performing that, that massaging. Um, so I think that that would be the way I would put it. It doesn't provide you what you need for governance when you spin up a new account. And there's not sort of an option that says alert on anomalous activity within IAM. And there are other services that you can leverage that will have that sort of anomaly detection and things like uh, uh, <clears throat> CloudTrail will be used to generate a proper audit 
and then you can have other things like uh, AWS config, or you can write your own um, correlation rules using something like Lambda that will get you the information you need. Uh, so I think that would answer the question. Um, so continuous visibility, um, sort of very apt for the topic, um, or the, the question is very sort of well-timed. Um, the way to maintain security within the accounts would be to ensure that you have continuous visibility. You want to avoid a situation where you spin something up, uh, you have it configured as secure, and then you hand it over for actual use, and it suffers from all sorts of configuration drift. Uh, so generally, the way you avoid that, um, the key thing here is to have audit logs being generated for each of the actions that take place. And then you want to create alerts for things that you don't expect to have happen. So for example, uh, you can have an alert being generated when uh, credentials that are associated with an EC2 instance are used to request actions um, from a non-AWS IP. Typically, that means that somebody has been able to get your credentials leaked, um, as we covered earlier, potentially through something like an SSRF um, that gets them valid credentials, and then they leverage that outside of AWS. Um, it's not a perfect way to detect your credentials are compromised because they could very easily spin up uh, an EC2 instance within the same region and use them, uh, but it does eliminate sort of the immediate um, low level leak credential scenarios where somebody gets credentials, immediately tries to use them to see what they can do. Uh, root account activity of any kind. Um, you generally only want to use a root account to create your first user, or if you're within an organization, uh, you never want to use a root account at all. Um, the reason for that is that the root account, uh, with most systems, it, it sort of is a super user. It can do pretty much anything. IEM policies do not apply to it. Um, so if you have root account, you can pretty much do anything within the account. Uh, and then one of the other sort of primary things you want to have is uh, an alert that triggers whenever um, an administrative access policy is granted. The sort of next item uh, in terms of preventing these threats would just be understanding the services. Uh, it's something we've talked about quite a bit already this evening. Uh, what you need to do is uh, just to ensure that you have at least a, a basic understanding of how the service works, uh, particularly the valid use cases and things that users might want to leverage the service to do, um, as well as potential entry points or attack vectors for the service. Uh, there, unfortunately, is no easy way of Getting this understanding, it requires researching the services. Uh, that sort of entails doing things like reading the available documentation, uh, playing around with the service a bit yourself. And then finally, if you're looking for uh, potential attack vectors, one great way is to look for bug bounty disclosures uh, that relate to the service that you're interested in using, uh, just to better understand how they have actively been exploited. Um, and whether or not that is something that um, has been resolved in your circumstance or, or whether that's going to be a concern moving forward as well. Uh, so just to for sum up, uh, security of the AWS environment is a shared responsibility. Uh, it is not something that you can do uh, to just leave it to AWS and expect that your data will be secure. Um, it does require your active participation to ensure that both the infrastructure and your data remain secure. 
uh, along that path, uh, you have to understand that services have uh, obligations in terms of being securely configured, um, as well as understanding any limits that might exist on their access controls and how those can impact uh, sort of threats that might be identified. And finally, um, maintaining a secure environment, uh, it does require sort of continuous review, continuous monitoring. Uh, that way you are aware of any potential configuration drift. Um, like I said earlier, it's not enough to simply have your environment initially configured securely and then push it out and give it to users you have to have some type of continuous review ongoing process for ensuring that as things are used, as they continue to be used, they remain secure. Uh, so that's sort of everything in summary. Quick uh, introduction to AWS security and threats um, that should be sort of a concern if you are moving to an AWS environment. So again, thank you for your time. Thank you, Jason. Um, so this concludes the uh, event for tonight. Uh, my apologies uh, for the technical difficulties that we have experienced. Um, this is our first time trying YouTube live streams. Uh, we will get better at this and hopefully the next session uh, will be a little less uh, uh, eventful. Um, if you have any further questions uh, for us, uh, feel free to reach out and I'm sure Jason would be happy to have, answer questions offline. Uh, right, Jason? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, if anybody has any questions, they can reach out to me directly. And, and I can't promise you have an answer to the questions, <laughs> but uh, I, I will do my best. Okay, awesome. Thanks for that. And uh, as Jason mentioned, we will be uh, posting the presentation on our uh, OWASP Toronto website. So uh, look out for the link once uh, we've got that ready. Um, so once again, I'd like to thank Jason from Security Compass for, for this presentation and sharing um, your insights on AWS security. Thank you. A uh, huge thank you to Jack Anders. He's the one who has set this whole thing up. And uh, without him, I don't think we would have had a, uh, a live YouTube stream. So thanks to Jack. Uh, obviously, also uh, thank you, Adam and Ophi on the OWASP Toronto team for making this happen. Um, I am Duke Fei Chan from the OWASP Toronto team. Uh, thank you for attending tonight. And uh, See you uh, at our next event, which uh, will likely be uh, in early May. Um, it will be from uh, a company who works on a static analysis tool. So uh, more, inf more information on that uh, coming out soon. Uh, thanks again, and have a good night, and stay safe.